All right, welcome back everyone. Uh, this video, we're actually changing gears a little bit away from combined loading and into a much more civil engineering related topic of beam design or sizing a beam in order to support a given load. So I would say uh, combined loading really important for the mechanical engineering students, especially those going to uh, machine design. And this is really important for the civil engineering students um, when they go into structural theory. So let's talk about how we figure out a beam or how we size a beam. And in general, what we end up doing is we're basing it on the bending moment. And then we go back and we check for the shear. And then we check if it'll support the loads without deflecting too much. So that's in general what we do. Um, I will say that sometimes we might know uh, that deflection is going to govern, so we might design it based on deflection and then check shear and then check they'll handle the bending moment. We rarely base the beam on the shear because shear almost never governs, which is good because that VQ over IT is a pain in the butt anyways, right? So, um, so with that in mind, let's talk about our uh, if we're going to base this on our bending stress, we know that we have an equation that looks like this. Our sigma stress is equal to mc over i. Well, I can rearrange this equation and move, uh, let's see, my moment of inertia over the c, which was the distance from the neutral axis out to the extreme fiber, is equal to the moment, the external moment, divided by the stress. And the reason I'm doing this is we're going to define a new variable. This new variable is going to be called a section modulus. So designated with an S, which is equal to the moment of inertia over our C value, the distance out to the extreme fiber. Um, and the reason we do that is because this is, this is based on the beam's cross-section, and that's based on the beam cross-section, so we get a relationship we can look up in a table. And now we can rewrite, rewrite the equation that we have up above saying that our section modulus is equal to our maximum moment, that would be from a moment diagram, over an allowable stress. So that's our, our basic equation that we're going to um, pick our beam with. Now, what we're going to do is after we figure out our beam and the way our, sorry, our section modulus, and the way we can figure out our section modulus is based on what load we're trying to support. We can figure out our maximum moment, and whatever material it's made out of will tell us what our sigma is. We may look that up in a table. Uh, after we have an S value, then we can look up our S in, uh, in tables. So uh, one of these tables is produced by AISC, uh, the American Institute of Steel Construction, and I provided a link in the posted notes that you can click on. If you click on that link, you end up with something that looks like this. So you want to scroll down to the shape database, and within the shape database, uh, we have version 15. It'll come up as an Excel file. And then open up that Excel file and you'll end up with something that looks like this. First you have this disclaimer, but you want to click the tab down here which says Database version 15. And that has a whole bunch of I-beams. These are all I-beams as I scroll down, scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. The M stands for miscellaneous and we have some HP, uh, which are piles. We have C channels, miscellaneous channels. We got a bunch of things, L brackets, but what we're going to be concerned with are the W's. Everything that starts with a W. Now a W is an I-beam. We'll define what these numbers mean in just a second here, but I just wanted you to see this table. If I scroll across, I have all these different properties of each I-beam. Now this is a big long table that the civil engineering students will have to get to know at some point, probably during steel design, but for this class, uh, because it is so big and cumbersome, we just want, we're just more concerned with what uh, the process, right? So instead, what we're going to use is this abbreviated table in the Hibbler text. It's, a, it's a, one of the appendices, and what I have done is I have put it on Blackboard for you. So if you want to find this, this is under Content, Textbook Images, and these are the I-beam tables, so it's Appendix B and Hibbler. If you click on that, you end up with something that is much smaller and more reasonable where I just have, for I-beams, I have two tables for the um, uh, for standard. 
and some C channel, which we won't use, I'll bracket we'll use, and then two tables for metric. So really it ends up being about four sheets. So you'll want these for the exam. You probably want to print them out or have them, have them close to you so you can use them. So let's talk about how we use uh, these tables. Actually, before we talk about how we use those tables, let's talk about what an I-beam is or the labeling of an I-beam. Uh, an I-beam, the reason it's called an I-beam is it's shaped like an I. And it looks something like that. And you might have a label that looks something like this, a W6 by 12. All right, so if we have a label of something like a W6 by 12, the W stands for a wide flange I-beam. And the six represents the depth of the beam. And that's basically your, your clear distance. So the, the little I-beam that I have drawn, we're saying it's this dimension right there. And that would be in inches if it's a standard unit. I believe they're in millimeters if it's a metric. And the last one is the 12. Uh, and the 12, a lot of people immediately say, well, I have to do this width or something else since the first one's depth. But no, the 12 is the weight of the beam per linear foot. So here we know that this W6 by 12 weighs uh, 12 pounds per foot. So now that we know that, I can take a look at the tables. Uh, this is a table from the Hibbler text and this is actually the metric one. So uh, for example, I see a W610 by 155. It does even tell me the unit. So it's, a, it's 610 millimeters deep and it has a weight of 155 kilograms per meter. Um, we have these other uh, section properties, the cross-sectional area, the depth, and we do have a little diagram so you can see depth is that total depth. Also note that we do have a number here I said is the depth and then we have the actual depth. So one is 610, one is 611. Why is there a difference? Or 610 and 617. This is nominal versus actual. So what it's called or it's naming, these are all considered to be about 610, but technically their, their actual depths will vary slightly. So make sure you keep that straight and don't automatically assume that a 610 is exactly 610. It's like a two by four is not a two by four. It's actually one and a half by three and a half. Uh, we have web thickness. You can see that's the thickness of, of, by the way, this is the web part. We have the flanges or the top and bottom. So we have thickness of the web, uh, flange thickness, width. And then we have these properties with the XX and YY. Now what we're concerned with is the XX 99.9% .9 of the time. So this is the strong direction, meaning I'll have my loads going this way. Then I want the moment of inertia, which we talked about about this x direction, which is my strong direction. Here's our new variable we defined, our section modulus s. This last column, radius of gyration, we'll talk about that later. You may have seen radius of gyration in uh, dynamics. Of course, I think they called it k in there, but whatever. And then the other thing you should note is the way these tables are organized is by depth of beam. So there's my 610s, my 460s, my 410s, so on and so forth, with my 360s down there. Um, so that's the table. Uh, like I said, there's two pages for the metric. And let's go ahead and look at an example of how I would size my beam based on this concept of a section modulus. Okay, so for this example, what we're given is we need to support a maximum moment of 50 kilonewtons per meter. And we have, sorry, kilonewton meters. And we have a maximum shear force of 25 kilonewtons. We have a maximum allowable stress of 25, 125 megapascals and a maximum shear stress of 25 megapascals. So typically you get these two values from your uh, shear and moment diagram. And typically these two values you, you, you get from a table, you know, those material property tables. Usually it would be, um, I don't know, like say this, is, this one actually looks like it's a steel of some sort. You may have a safety factor in there. It might be given to you, or you might have to look it up. But to find the lightest I-beam, what we want to do is we want to start by looking at this new variable, a section modulus. And this would be like the minimum section, section modulus required to support this bending force, right? This bending moment of 50 kilonewton meters. So we said our section modulus is equal to the moment over my allowable stress. And the moment 
is 50 kilonewton meters. I gotta watch those units though, so I'm gonna multiply by a thousand twice, once for the, the newtons, and once to convert it into millimeters. And then the, um, my sigma, I have 125 megapascals, uh, which is a newton per millimeter squared. You can go through and follow your units if you want. You'll find out your section modulus ends up with a length cubed. So in this case, I have 400 times 10 to the third millimeters cubed. So the reason I'm using this times 10 to the third instead of just four, I don't know what that would be, four and however many zeros, is because if I look up here, when I'm looking at my section modulus, it's already times 10 to the third. So I can compare like, you know, 400 to the 400 in the table. So after I have this value, and I know that that's the, the minimum section modulus that I need, I know that I must have this, the, the actual beams section modulus must be greater than uh, 400 times 10 to the third. So the way that I choose to do this is I go block by block and I say, all right, so let's start with my 150 millimeter deep beams and then I come over to my section modulus in the XX direction, this column over here, and I say, which beam has at least 400? And I go up and I see, well, none of them do. The most it has is 274, so that won't even work. So I go up to my next block of beams, my 200, and say, which one has at least 400? And I see this guy right there, which is what? A W200 uh, by 46. So I make note of that. Um, let me just do all these at once. And then I do the same thing with the 250s. I go up to my 400, at least 400, so it looks like it's a 250 by 45. So I have gotten lighter. I started out with 46 uh, kilograms per meter. Now I'm down to 45 kilograms per meter, so I'm going in the right direction. And then I move up to my 310s, and what do I have here? It looks like I have a 310 by 33, so I've gotten even lighter. Now I'm at 33 kilograms per meter. Okay, and then I'm gonna move up to the next table to get to my 360s. And I need at least 400, it looks like that bottom one. So that's a 360 by 33. So now we're at 33 pound, or sorry, kilograms per meter. Before I was also at 33 kilograms per meter. Okay, so those are the same. But keep going uh, to the 410s. And it looks like the bottom one, I have a 410 by 39. So it looks like I'm starting to get heavier. Uh, these will all be the minimum amount, so now I'm up to a 52. So I could keep going, there's only one more to do, I might as well do it, but clearly these aren't going to be the lightest because I have a, um, they're just getting too darn big, right? So as a summary, this is uh, what I looked up from the table that would work. So those are the five beams identified that, that would work. And like I said earlier, what are the lightest? The 33s, I have two of them, they tied for the lightest. So I would choose one of those two. Now, if it were me and I were an engineer, technically cost-wise it'd be the exact same. Which one would I choose? I would choose the one with the larger S. Uh, the reason I would choose the one with larger section modules is it means it's just a little bit stronger for the exact same weight. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose a W360 by 33. Technically, either answer is right at that at this place. But so then we said after we pick a beam based on this section modulus or bending moment, what we need to do is we need to check to make sure that this beam will not fail due to the shearing force. And we have an equation for shear. It says tau is equal to V Q over I T. Remember that dreaded Q in our areas and all that kind of stuff. Well, it's kind of a pain in the butt because if I look, I have my, uh, I mean, at least it's symmetric, right? But I'd have two different areas in here and then I have these little fillets in here and then you have all sorts of stuff going on. Just too much, too complicated because we like to save time. Uh, call it lazy, call it efficient, call it what you want. For I-beams, we actually create a little, quick little check. And this little check is that I, for I-beams, we're going to say we're going to use the average shear stress on the web. So what that looks like is just the area that goes 
along here from top to bottom. And we're saying if we put the load over that entire web area, would we be all right? So uh, so now we can say for average, remember average, we did that in the very first, I don't know, first week. We said that our shear stress, pull average to remind me, is equal to the shear force over that area. All right, well, that's the same thing as the uh, thickness of the web times the depth of the beam. That's that red shaded part that I just shown, right? So that's equal to 25 times 10 to the third newtons for my force. And then for thickness of the web, and for D, I go back up to this beam. This is the 360 by 33. So I come up to my 360 by 33. I got way too much going on here, don't I? And I say, what is my thickness of the web? 5.84, it's my web thickness in millimeters. And what's the depth of the beam? Remember, the depth is not necessarily 360. In fact, it's all the way down to a 349. So, Coming down here, I have thickness of the web, 5.84 millimeters, and the depth of 349 millimeters. Uh, and I calculate all that to be 12.27 megapascals. And I said that I have an allowable shear, in the very beginning problem, beginning of the problem of um, 25. And because this is much less than 25 megapascals, then I am okay. So hopefully that made sense. I will possibly put up a second example problem. Um, I'll see how this one goes. But let me know if you have any questions, comments, and I'll talk to you all soon. Thanks.